7 p.m. Central. Man, what a week. I'm excited about this one. We have my friend, no longer can I say Rob. I can't say Carol. I can't say Rob Carol. It's official Dr. Dr. Rob Carroll. And um, and he's been to school. He paid the money. He finished the classes. He wrote some long thing. And so he has earned it, man. So uh, we give him some respect. Doc, the doc, <laughs> Rob Carroll, man. I love it. So uh, Rob and I met years ago, and I first met his teachers at a Teaching a Rockstar event, and they were amazing. And they told me all about their school and their principal. Then I went out there to Kentucky and saw what he was doing with his amazing school at the 1199 South Heights Elementary in Henderson, Kentucky. And it was, uh, man, it, I just, uh, every time I talk to this guy, every time I'm around him, I think about him, I see what he's doing online with his leadership and his instruction and education and kids and teachers. It is awesome. I'm glad he's here. Dr. Rob Carroll, it's official, brother. The doctorate. Man, you got, <laughs> now, I don't know if you look smarter, but you got to feel smarter. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have to remind myself that I'm, I'm Dr. Rob Carroll. Someone called me that in class a couple of months ago and said, Dr. Carroll, and I didn't answer because I didn't know they were talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I feel that was sometimes when somebody says Mr. Bowman, I'm like, is my dad here? <laughs> and I'm 52, man. That's a I'm great still... age right there. How old are you? 52. Same, 52. same. Yeah, I had a pandemic birthday, March 19th. Hey, let me ask you a question. Did you uh, did you post one of those pictures? You know, everybody's posting high school pictures. Did you post because you what are you class of eighty six? Is that right for you? Class eighty six. No way, my senior pictures going up. No way, my credibility going down. I had, I was <laughs> solid Miami Vice in my senior pic. I had the hair, man. I look like ew, I look like something out of the MTV video, man. It was <laughs> glorious. Yeah, I didn't get many dates in high school, so that pic's not going up. Well, listen, you got that one date that worked out pretty well for your brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's back there in the bedroom. I told her not to come out. She's going to be on live. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let me ask you. Tell us, so um, for those people who don't know the whole 1199 story, could you kind of take us through that from what was going on with the school when you showed up in um, at South Heights Elementary, kind of what was the performance was academically, what was going on at the elementary school there, and some of the things you saw your first year and how you're probably faking it as a principal your first year, and then uh, and then kind of take us through what, you know, what happened at the end of your run. Okay, cool. Uh, back in school year 97, 98, uh, they had an opening at South Heights Elementary, and it was a school, even though I lived in Henderson County, uh, I'd only been to that school to teach summer school. I really, it just was not a place I ever hung out. There was really nothing in our part of town uh, there that, that I went to go do. So I didn't know too much about it, um, but I was lucky enough to get hired. Uh, we had site-based council decision-making, so I was lucky enough to get hired. Um, so back then, um, I walked into a school with about 450 preschool through sixth graders, amazing kids, amazing kids, but they were amazing kids who were easily and quickly disenchanted, disenchanted if you weren't real. Um, if I'm being honest, uh, the culture there was not one of very high expectations for those students. And um, there were only several adults there that I really truly think uh, just had kids best interest in mind. So we immediately, that, that just, that wasn't good enough. So we immediately started doing things. And when I say we, it was just like a handful of us. And we started making things better for kids. We started asking kids what they needed, what wasn't going on. Cause at that point, if we look at it from purely an achievement standpoint, um, it, we were a bottom 25 of all schools in the state of Kentucky and talk about coronavirus right now. I remember principals meetings being in the bottom 25. No one would sit close. They were worried that those kind of achievement scores were contagious. And so we just kind of changed how we did business. Um, the better we made things for kids, ironically, uh, the people that weren't there for kids just didn't like it. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to lose some of those people. And I would use that core group of people that were really good people. And it didn't matter what role they had in the school. Uh, they would help me hire and bring in new team members. And uh, we just 
we became a different kind of school. We, uh, we went all in for our kids. Uh, we really had the mindset that if it wasn't good enough for our own biological children, it would not be good enough for the kids of South Heights. And we took that example and every opportunity we had, uh, yada, yada, yada. We kept on adding team members, doing incredible things for kids. In 2004, we got the National School Change Award from Fordham University. Uh, we were climbing. Uh, we got as high as 37th, I believe, from the top in the state of Kentucky. Um, and we kind of, we hung out in the top third pretty much for the rest of my, my tenure there. And uh, it was just an incredible group of people that came together around kids at the right time. You know, I finished watching The Office over this pandemic and I don't know, I mean, there are a lot of creepy characters on The Office, but I, I think that was kind of like us uh, because it was all these weird people that absolutely did uncommon things for kids and kids bought into it and adults bought into it. And we still have relationships today. So it, it just, it became an amazing place. So I don't know. I do know, man. And here's the thing, you know, that I, it's funny that you brought it up because now that you mention it, I don't, I don't think you've ever really consciously thought about it, but it, I think it's especially true at elementary schools. When I think about some of the really cool places and the cool campuses I've been and what I've seen and hung out with those teachers, you're right, man. You talk about a bunch of wackos and, um, it, it, like in the most beautiful, loving way, like it's those people that, um, are just relentless in the pursuit of doing amazing stuff for kids and i think maybe to have that kind of personality where you don't give up and you don't quit and you don't find excuses just keep pushing forward i think there's a little bit of like a weirdo mentality going on in the you know up in the noodle yeah i mean yeah i mean you have to i think steve Jobs said you know you have to be crazy and you have to love what you do or it's just too hard and we were both i mean we would have staff meetings and you know, people would walk in and we'd have teachers down there and they would have blenders and there would be no alcohol, but they'd have blenders and didn't matter which staff member walked in, uh, we'd all yell, Norm. And that's how we entered our staff meeting. You know, we'd, we'd <laughs> drink. I mean, it took that level of edge and I don't know, but it was, it, it's just, it's the best thing I'll ever be a part of. I was such a lucky man. And it, I was just surrounded by amazing adults and even better kids. You know, man, the thing is, um, I think what's interesting also is sometimes we see those types of campuses and schools and it's as if, um, I don't know, maybe people think like maybe just the planets aligned on the right day and it just kind of happened. I don't think they think about the strategic work that goes in for years and years and years of finding the right people to put that together. Because when you guys had an opening, like it was a big deal to find the right person. Yeah, that was one of my favorite things was our hiring process. And we always tweaked it, uh, but we were definitely like, people would bring in those big portfolios and my hiring team would all roll their eyes and we'd take them and we'd set them in the floor. <laughs> but I mean, we did, we tried really everything because we we figured out we, we hired enough people that were technically good, but they didn't match our culture. So it was a big waste of investment and time. Yeah. So we decided when we hired to go after people that had the right mindset. And so we, we had a kid interview team that would interview the adults before we got to them. Uh, we would sometimes have an interview team of like 15 or 16 people. Uh, we interviewed at midnight to see if they'd come in. We interviewed on the weekend. I don't ever do this, but when everybody goes out to the lake at the beginning of summer, we interviewed on that weekend because if they won't come in off the lake to interview at the 1199, we don't want them. So we did a lot of crazy things, interviewed outside, all kind of crazy stuff. But we got some great team members. I had some of the best people in the world. And anybody can do it. Just yeah. got to figure it out. Hey, how did you get the name change? Like, how, what was your motivation for that? What was the impetus that, you know, inspired you to go from South Lights Elementary and to this hashtag, the 1199? Uh, here's ironic based on our, our pre-show discussion. I remember we were uh, – I mean, I'm a man's man, it's obvious. I mean, we're both sporting really <laughs> awesome beards. But uh, I remember I was watching Home and Garden Channel and there was like this show called Man Caves and it, it had these frat dudes that were about my age and for whatever reason, their frat house was on the ad, the like the, 
the 1720, it was 1725 Maple Street or something. Yeah. So when they got this 40 something guy's man cave down in his basement and he's like a dentist now, they called it and they put it on the wall, the 1725. And I was just sitting there going, that's awesome. So the next day we had a, I, we changed our name from staff meeting to team meeting. So I'm going to change it right now because staff is an infection team is what we want to be. And so we had a team meeting and then I proposed that because for the longest time, our address was a place of shame and yeah. we had changed it and things were going really well. So proposed, let's go and call ourselves the 1199 and uh, it stuck and people that didn't even get to go to South Heights, did you hear I say got to go, uh, got to go to South Heights, uh, wanted 1199 t-shirts and some people got tattoos. It's a, it was a good, good move, good marketing move. I think so. It's all about, I think sometimes we forget about that is, um, you know, we read a lot of professional uh, development stuff in terms of education and culture, but there's a lot of great stuff in the business world that we can certainly apply to education in our schools and just having the brand is something that people want to be a part of and something that feels cool and feels like a family. I think that um, most importantly is what the 1199, you know, it really represented um, not just the school, not just the family, but like, like you're a part of a revolution. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, leadership's all around you. Just look for great examples. Great. I got a lot of great ideas. It's going to sound bad, but got a lot of great ideas from my, you know, when I was a member of a fraternity in college, you know, they took these like 40 diverse guys. And by the end of the semester, we're ready to kill for each other. Yeah. And they had like a good recipe and not all of it involved alcohol. And um, they were, it was about bringing people together around this common mindset. And we employed a lot of that. You know, it, it was about, we even used, they would end all of their, our fraternity meetings with, um, oh, I'm blacking out. All my friends are going to kill my fraternity brothers. But anyways, they would end it with a, a certain saying, we use that at South Heights too. So um, that'll come to me later. I'm getting old, 52. So <laughs> You know, um, Tony Hull just chimed in. She, Dr. Dr. Tony Hull, she's in your little doctor club, and um, she chimed in. And you know, she her campus at the Mesilla Valley Leadership Academy in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Oh. She has one of those campuses, much like yours, where it um, it's that um, like you have. It, I hate the word misfits, but you used it. Like you know, some of the weirdos and the wackos that come to um, school. And I think what it is like those people. Um, those teachers that you guys have found and these teams of world-class educators, they're just able to connect with kids on such a deep level. And I think that might look weird to the outside because it's almost as if it's magical. Do you know what I mean? Like when they can build that immediate connection, it looks like magic when they're just, I think they're just wired that way. When I, when I was principal there and I would teach over at USI adjunct and, and, uh, I would get questions from like the students and they're like, Oh, well, you know, we've been told not to hug kids. And I couldn't hide on my face. I'm like, Why don't, you don't hug kids or don't tell right. them. Um, we just did. I mean, really, I don't know. We lead like you want to be led. We taught like we wanted to be, we taught like we want to be taught. We loved our kids. Like we wanted to be loved. And it, it, it probably did look different. I mean, heck, you know, <laughs> yeah, we we just did whatever we needed to do to make them happy and inspired. Hey, Laura, as uh, cop shivers chiming in, man, I don't know what any of this means. That's it. That's it. Laura saved me. Cop shiver, the best teacher ever. That I I love rumpus. I know I black out nowadays. It's early onset dementia. I love and respect all my brothers. Was how we <laughs> ended our fraternity meeting, but we added an AS. I love and respect all my brothers and sisters. So we ended every like document with that so copy thanks for having my back <laughs> <laughs> hey also um <clears throat> dr hold one of me uh um and i don't know why i didn't bring this up you know she she took over their alternative school and she rebranded it like and now it's called the Massive Valley Leadership Academy. I like, why it. would you call anything the alternative school you're about to get some alternative behavior at the alternative That's school right. Yeah. So it is the leadership Academy. And, and, that, and I mean, that's, that's what you get. Like when you speak life into it, when you say the word and you brand it, it gives those kids an expectation to live up to, you know, it reminds me of a friend of mine, um, 
uh, Victoria Masichek, she, um, she has a family reunion for her class. Oh. And, and so the kids come back year after year and for, and now for generations, like class year generations of kids come back year after year. So, and I don't even think she gets how powerful that is, but one of the things she does right at the beginning of the year is she assigns uh, in her class of second or third grades. I can't remember um, the, the position, what role they're going to play at the family reunion. Okay. You're okay. You bring the cups. Okay. And, you, and you're, you're in charge of dessert and you're going to be in charge of getting the hot dogs. And you're in charge. So these kids like, Oh my, this is really a family and we're really having a reunion and I'm in charge of the cups. Like, <laughs> like already that draws them in, man. Like it's that those powerful things. I mean, I love it so much. That that's a great idea. I mean, that's that impact that just keeps on going and going. We stay connected and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I love it. It's my favorite yeah. thing. Man, the um you're right, that whole um don't don't touch kids. I mean, that is I mean, that was you know, even at the high school, I'm talking working with gangsters. I'm not and I'm not saying that like a, like these are kid these are they're kids, but they were incarcerated as gang members. And now they're coming to their freshman year and they're 17. And like that, I mean, that handshake, man, that hand on the shoulder, you know, the, you know, the nucks, whatever it was that eventually led to the hug, you know, five or six months later, like that, that is why I, that's how I was able to get in their world and to be able to teach. That, I mean, it, brain science you know when you're touching people there's good chemicals that are going on so there's a guy lovejoy brothers two big twins gargantuan good boys and i give them a hug every time i see them and they'll pick me up off the ground but it feels good and it feels good to me it feels good to them i mean that's backed by science so why wouldn't we do stuff that's backed by science pat on yeah. the shoulders it could be a big deal hey man i know um you know, based on your experience and um, all that you've uh, have all that you've contributed for those school leaders that are coming, you know, to you in, in conversation and online and on the phone, and what what type of advice are you giving them during this time? Because man, this is so unprecedented, unchartered. We don't. There's no um, rule book on how to do this. What you know? What type of advice are um, you, you able to give folks? I. You know, Stacy and I, we've been working with idea rules. We've been we've been putting stuff together like what does a culture, a school culture look like coming out of a pandemic? So we've been trying to identify like what's this going to look like? Uh, but right now, you know, I've tried to put myself, you know, in the place if I was still principal at South Heights, what I'd be doing. And I, th I think my main priority, number one main priority, it would be to somehow make sure that connection was still strong. You know, I see examples all over. I watch the guy, Jim Halpert's show on, on uh, his good news thing that he's got going, John Krasinski or whatever. But yeah, I see this math teacher outside of a glass door with a marker board showing a kid what to do because the kid just can't get it. And I just think whatever we could do, my advice to anybody or the advice I'm giving right now to leaders is make sure you're connecting with your kids, make sure you're connecting with adults. If it seems strange, do it anyways. Look for every avenue, whether it's mailing a letter, whether it's stopping by and getting some sidewalk chalk and drawing something on the square of sidewalk in front of their house in the middle of the night so they wake up to it. Uh, there's a teacher of an Evansville superstar her name's Alex. Uh, she found some signs that says your teacher loves you and she's going to stake them in their front yard. That connection has to, has to continue through. I think the, the, the scholastic part, the academic part will work its way out. Teachers are killing themselves and creating yeah. great content. Kids are working hard and adults are pulling their hair out at home, but that connection, kids cannot feel like they're being left out in the island. So that would be my priority. Keep that yeah. connection. Strong. Text your cop shepherds, make sure she's doing okay. You know, stuff. Yeah. Like you know, I, I think um, recently a, um, a school district asked me to be at a part of their morning meetings that they do. And they, they asked people from around the country to chime in for their teachers and based on the letter. So it was an alphabetical something to COVID and, and my letter was D. And um, so I had to come up with three D words. I don't do that because I want to win. So I came up with about 10. And so my, my first D was um, um, dig down deep and deliver. And that was 
all about, you know, using this time as an educator to dig down deep into those questions. Like, what do I really want for my kids? What's the real lesson that I want the kids to remember? This is a time they can remember forever. Like this is this generation's great depression or, yeah. or nine 11. And when we come back together as a family, in this class and we're, we're going to go back and most of the school districts I know they're going to bring the kids back together where they left for a day or two. And then if it's next year, we're going to send them on. And for, for, for you as an educator, what's the real lesson you want that kid and dig down deep into that. And then you have to say it, you know, we, I think when kids are around us in the school, um, they know we love them. They can see it. There's evidence of it, but now on like, you have to say the words. You have to yeah. tell the kid and like look him in the eye on Zoom or through the window or on the street or at where we've seen at Walmart or wherever it is and let them know that you love them, you care about them, and you're constantly thinking about them. Like that is so critical. Yeah. I mean, like you said, this is uncharted. I mean, I remember Cass was in kindergarten at 9 11, and that was like one day followed by several, you know, months of, of kind of weirdness. But I mean, this is, like you said, is uncharted. I mean, I, I asked the other day, is this going to be another point on the A scale chart? You know, you know, yeah. a kid dealing with a pandemic. Um, so I don't know. Keep that connection strong. However, and I, I'd say look for really weird and different and alternative methods and, and just do whatever's necessary. I mean, heck, it's going to make you feel good. It's going to get you out of your house. And yeah, um, I don't know. That would be my priority, number one. Yeah, I think for me to make yourself, you know, is it kind of the teacher self care is I get a lot of heat for this brother, but I don't care. And, um, you know, I'm 52. I've given up on caring is um, the uh, for teacher self care. Like I really want I for sure want teachers to take care of themselves emotionally and rest and relax and recover and all those for sure. But in addition to that, my second D was um, dare to do the difficult. And that is like resting and recovering and taking a bath or whatever you do. I, I get it. And watching Netflix. Okay, cool. <laughs> but what really makes you feel good, what really fuels you is doing something that's hard and doing something, you know, you should do, but you haven't got yourself to do it. Daring to do the difficult. And that includes whatever it might do, whatever it takes to connect with a kid and remind them that you're thinking about them and that they're still a part of your class, even though we're not in the building, we're not in our classroom that man, it's still in our heart and letting kids know that. I, I can't wait for all the like the incredible examples. I try to keep on top of them, see them as much as I can. But all the incredible examples that are going to come out after this is over with, of of connections that were made between kids and adults, and and how they got each other through this. And I think they're going to be huge. Um, I don't know. And like you said, it could be difficult, but that that's the fun part. That's what we're in it for. That's what's going to make our heart grow. So we'll catch them up on the academics for sure. Yeah. I mean, like the difficult, the challenging part that that's what brings us back. Like that's where, that's why we love this gig. You know, it's I always say like, imagine you went to a bowling alley and they had the bumpers and the, you know, and the thing on the sides, the bumpers and the, you couldn't get them off. What if that was the thing? No, no one would ever go. Cause you, you know, what if you had a strike every time? Then that takes the fun out of it, man. Like it's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be challenging. And that's why people go back. That. Yeah. That we would talk about that at South Heights at the 1199. That, yeah, there were schools that were easier. Every school has its challenges, but there were schools that were definitely easier to teach at. But you got to love the hard. That's why you're here. That's why you showed up at midnight to interview, because you just like stuff a little bit different. And that's why we like you. We never want in the interview. If someone said they want a job here, just get a foot in the door or just whatever. We're like, we want to know that you want here and you're, even if you're lying to us, you're not going to interview anywhere else. This is the only place you want to be. Yeah. There's something magical about that. And I said, um, you know, it was interesting when I went, when I went to over there to speak and um, I, it's hard to talk about And I'm not saying that there's one way is better or another way. It's just the way it is. But when like, um, you know, everybody kind of trickles in to the auditorium, but then all of a sudden, this whole mob, the 1199 comes in and boom, they all sit together in one place. And everybody else is kind of spread out everywhere else. And then at the break, they all stand up together and all the teachers go together and then they all come back together and they all sit back down together. It was cool, man. It's like really noticeable. There, there's something special going on with that crew. One day we, we had an opening day, opening convocation or whatever. And the, the district would chart out how many seats you're supposed to have. 
and we never got it right. I don't know what, for what reason, but I remember one year that we, South Heights was supposed to be down front and a big chunk of us were down there, but they didn't give us enough seats. So there was a couple of us in the back where nobody sat and our entire staff got up from the front and went back and sat with a few in the back. Yeah. Badass. I really liked it. That was an indicator of a great culture and I knew it. You know, it's working at that point when you see things like that, you know, like no one's left behind that kind of feeling. No, no, it was, it was good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things I learned from you is, um, I mean, there's a lot, but one of the most valuable things, and I thought about it before, I never talked about it openly until you would talk about it openly. And that is, um, we spend so much time talking about making the kids a priority. And I think it's important. It really is like, that's the part that's priority, but talking about it, that, that it's not, but it's not the only priority. The other priority are the people, the family that teach those kids in many, many schools because the, the, the kids aren't just the priority. They're the only priority. The, fa- the teachers get left behind and no one thinks about them as a family. And as a result, they burn out. And man, like this job, especially at some places, like maybe even South Heights, if you're in this alone as a teacher, you're going to burn out, man. You, it's like it is impossible. Like you need to be part of a family. So collectively and synergistically you can go and teach and make a difference in the lives of the kids. And I mean, as, as a principal, I really can change nothing. All I can do is kind of set the tone and, and do my part. But the people that are, that are working with kids straight on, I'm not going to go into cop shepherd's room and try to instruct her on any way of teaching her math. She would just laugh at me and push me out the door. <laughs> but I can give her freedom and I can buy her a, you know, I can buy her a favorite fountain drink and I can, you know, make sure that her air conditioner is working as quick as possible, even if I ignore someone else's. So you do whatever you can to take care of those people because they are your pipeline. They're right there. I I mean, that's it. I mean, and it may have looked like we were kind of adult centric but we were not adult centric. We were adult centric in the fact that we would take care of our adults and all of our team members because they serve the treasure. They serve the kids. And that's how our adult centrism looked. But it might've looked like, oh, we're just about the adults, but it wasn't. It was exactly what you said. Yeah. Hey, let me ask you this, man. When you are, now that you're at the university, and you're now Dr. Rob and you're doing your thing at the university and teaching our next generation of teachers, man, are you, are you, are you excited about what you find coming through there? Or are you disappointed or are you concerned? What's the vibe? No. Cause I got, I, that looked kind of ugly the way I said that. Oh, uh, I got kind of, I got kind of concerned cause I would hear some things whenever I was making that switch. Yeah. Uh, that, oh, you know, this is millennials and you're going to have to drag everything out of them, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, they're kids still. I am not discouraged at all. I mean, I could introduce you to Claire Munsterman and she would blow your mind right now. I could introduce you to Paul Fugate and he would rock your world right now. You know, in an AGR concert, he had AGR's lead singer drew threw a water bottle and it bounced off his fingers. And Paul told me about that in Education 201. And he's going to be a spectacular teacher. I feel really good because we've got a generation. They may be a little bit different. It's kind of Cassidy's generation. They may want to know the why for absolutely everything. Yeah. But they care, man. They care and they're willing to do things differently. And I'm okay with a generation that wants to know the why. I was a little bit like that, you know. Yeah. I didn't want to do something because someone told me something. So I am very encouraged for the future. Uh, I've got, I've, I've just been surrounded with great, great. Oh, I love them. I love them. Yeah. Hey, man, I think we were both. Uh why kids but i think these kids this is generation that they have been given a voice and permission to ask the question we just thought about it and kept our mouth shut you know (laughs) you know what i mean you know i think hey one one, one, one of my faves man uh uh don in the house and uh mrs warren she uh you know she reminds us you know i forget this too man like it's not it's not like we can pick and choose which kid needs us and which kid it's all of them like every single kid and 
you know, yeah, like I think we get we buy into that concept of focusing on the kid that we think needs us and we're not hearing from them. They're not doing the work. And do they have everything they need? And do they have Wi-Fi over at the apartment complex or we're in the mobile home or whatever? But, man, I'm talking about kids that, you know, that are doing the work. They have the laptop. They're in the home. They have two parents, both. But we really don't know what goes on in that kid's life in that home. And, man, I've said it a lot that – um, some of the most wealthy families um, that I, that I've seen um, have the most significant challenges with kids and the family structure. And then w what we think aren't there, they're, they're the other there's other families that live in poverty, but really they're the wealthy ones because those families are beautiful and connected and together and loving their kids. And um, I think it's just a reminder. It's like every single one of them we got to check on. People have asked me if I was a principal at a more affluent school, would I do things differently? And I might do things differently as far as some things and some of the things I do with adults, but as far as straight up with the kids, I don't think so. I used yeah. to think I'd do things differently, but now I'm going to love them. I'm going to love every one of them. I'm going to make sure they have access to what they need. So I agree with you. We can't just be checking on the kids that are, that are, you know, we feel like might be suspect because Every kid, my kids, your kids, they want to be checked on. You yeah. Know, we know that we care. So I agree. Yeah. Hey, let me ask you this. If you could have, um, man, if what, with those kids walking around from Dr. Carroll's 201 class, yeah. and um, I'm going to introduce you to them sometime. You're going to love them. Man, be me in there, dude. I'll talk to I them. I want to get you to USI because I want you to meet all these amazing teachers. Education 206 forever. 206. D dude, I'll do it. Um, let yeah. me ask you this, dude. Um, if So when, when they walk away, they're leaving your class and they're going through education, they graduate, they cross the stage, they interview, they get a job, they're walking into the classroom on that first day, they're flipping on the lights and the kids are about to come on first day of school, first year of teaching, first day. What is it that you hope that they're thinking about on that day? I, I am the variable for these kids' success. It is up to me to set the stage for them to be successful. And I cannot give up on any of them. And that's it. That's it. We talk about that and we talk about it in different delivery models. We talk about it with different theories and different disorders or whatever. But my main goal with education 206, main goal with any young person I work with at the university level is for you to accept accountability that you are choosing one of the most important professions and in no excuses it's up to you to get the job done. Yeah. I love it. You know, I, I always say it's, um, I, it's, I know it's hard to think about. I know it's hard to shift the, the mind sometimes, but for me, it's, it's a hundred percent. Like I want all this in my classroom to be a hundred percent my fault, every bit of it. And well, because that way when it's a hundred percent amazing, it's because I'm a hundred percent amazing. It's a hundred percent because I'm amazing. And, but, but the, the, the flip side of that, the challenge is when things suck, it's a hundred percent because of me. And that yeah. way I can change a hundred percent. If I, if I start saying, well, it's 20% because of this community and 30% because dumb Mr. Carroll's a principal and 10% because those parents, well, now I'm down the 40% left that I can have an impact on. I want to own a hundred percent so I can have an impact on a hundred percent. I agree. Great example. I think excuses are like poison ivy. You start scratching them and they're all over your body. And we just don't give ourselves a way out. I mean, at South Heights, we have discussions. And even though there might be something to the full moon in behavior, we would just go, okay, if there is, if there's data that supports it, that just means we got to up our game. We yep. just got our game. We know the full moon's coming. So there's absolutely no time for excuses anyway. Yeah. And, and I, I think kids are, you know, kids at the university level understand that and then connect with it. And, you know, some of the questions that we talk about, is like who is your absolute favorite teacher and why and they can immediately remember they can remember their name and they can remember exactly what they did but you know what when i say who's your least favorite teacher and why they can remember and they can remember exactly why and yep. i told them i got pictures of them standing up on top of their desk ripping a textbook in two don't tell anybody i did this ripping their textbook in two and i put it in a frame for and gave it to them and i said you put that on your desk and if you ever become not that person ripping those pages 
I'm all come haunt you. You know what yeah. I mean? So, man, that's the scary part of teach. That's, you know, for me, I think for a lot of teachers, that's terrifying. When you talk to people who are adults, you and I in our 50s, both of us, we can recall exact words that were said to us by ineffective teachers that didn't do a good job in a classroom. I remember details of what they said, what they did, what they said to me. And so as a teacher, that's terrifying because I know kids, well, all kids are going to do that too. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, I mean, you just watch them melt and, and it's not just the kid that's being demeaned by that teacher or low expectations. It's also the four or five kids that are listening right next to him going, yeah, man, I'm not going to do that because that going to do that to me. So teachers are variable. And, and, and that's why I think we have to take care of because it, it is hard. Yeah. Teachers are variable for success. That was one of our questions I interviewed. Who's a variable for success? And if someone said, well, it's the local economy, we went ahead, we had this secret signal and we start kicking people and we go to question number 17, even if that was question number two, they yeah. were out. Done. Gone. Yeah. Hey man, um, dude, I really, really appreciate you hanging out with us tonight, man. Thank you so much. Not just for um, all you've done for kids, but just a whole town at the, at the at the leadership i mean everything you're doing and at the and our next generation of teachers coming forward man it's um it's awesome man. i really appreciate you thank you hal you're my hero man ah <laughs> thanks for hanging with us man i love you brother all right love you see you later bye yeah that was cool huh